Welcome to Quarantine. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the science behind slime and tell you how to graph equations. Math Dad has a great lesson on graphing equations. I am Science Mom, and welcome to you. If you are new and joining us for the first time, we're happy to have you. Hello to Christina from Georgia, Esther and Ivan from Italy, Layla from California, Logan from California, Amy from New York, Mary from Maryland, and I'm seeing so many more in the chat. Pickle Obsessed, Haley, Science Girl, um, we're so happy, Science Boy Logan, Queen Donut, we're so happy to have you here with us today and a special welcome to you if you are watching the replay. Now let's get talking about slime. Slime is something that is quite popular to make and I have a video called The Science Behind Slime that you are welcome to watch if you would like a little bit more detail and I'll tell you that when I decided to make that video, what did you say, Matt, Dad? Uh, I was kind of skeptical. <laughs> Nobody cares about slime. Come on, science mom. You've got to finish up these other videos that you're supposed to be doing. And that slime video went on to for quite a while to be our number one video with the most views. And so Math Dad was like, oh, man, shows what I know. Yeah, I, I was totally wrong on that one. Math Dad is not a very big fan of slime. He thinks it's messy and kind of a pain. But I think slime is pretty cool, and I know that a lot of our people watching do too. Let's start with talking about glue. So what is glue? Um, I don't know, you've got some chemicals here that are kind of sticky, they like to stick together when they dry. You've got something, and, and that's a good point. It is liquid when it's wet, and then when it dries, it becomes hard. So school glue, white glue, and Elmer's glue is the most popular brand in the US, but there are a lot of varieties that are very similar. If you look on the back, there are no ingredients. This is a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. A lot of large companies are able to get away with not listing any ingredients because they say it's proprietary information. You know, we don't want anyone to steal our trademarked secrets and create our create recreate our item. So you cannot find a full list of what is in glue, but we know that the main ingredient is something called PVA or polyvinyl acetate. And it's really just a very long molecule. It's a polymer. And I'm gonna come around to the whiteboard in just a minute and we'll talk more about mon monomers and polymers. But first, let's take a look at just how, how glue behaves. So this is a little container that is full of glue. And if I were to stick my fingers in this, would I be able to like roll it into a ball and bounce it? It looks way too liquidy. It's it's very liquidy and very sticky. And you can see that this spoon is now completely covered in glue. And if I want to get it clean, I'm going to have to wash it off. Now, Math Dad, I'm going to have you hold two containers here. Okay. Right. This one is just water. This one is water with a little bit of borax. And we're going to put a scoop of glue into each container. So here's a dollop of glue into that one. Okay and then a dollop of glue into this one. And now, do you think I'd be able to pick up one of these? Like reach in with your fingers? Yeah, and reach in and just grab it. Um, Come just a little closer, and I will get a rag so that we don't. Gotta say, they, they look pretty darn similar to me. So if I try and reach in and pick up this one in the water, it's just runny glue, and the more I try and pick it up, the more it mixes in with the water and just kind of falls apart. Okay. But this one that we dropped into water with some boric acid, whoa, Ooh. what just happened? So now it's, like it's not sticking to my fingers anymore. And it is long and stringy and it's all sticking together. And that is because boric acid, let me, Whoops, I got like the pocket of glue on the inside that hadn't touched the boric acid. <laughs> and so I did get, I got slimed, you guys. So so glue doesn't have to dry to stick together. You made it, or it, stuck, it sticks to itself always, but. Now that's like, what just happened? Yeah. Let's, let's go to the board and we're gonna draw some molecules and explain the chemistry behind this because this is pretty cool. And I want to give a special thank you to our moderators in the chat, Science Mom Amber, Blanca Morales, and Science Mom Liza, who are on YouTube, helping us out, and then Science Mom Krista on Facebook. They are going to be helping answer questions, and they'll also pass questions on to us when we do Q&A in just a minute. So I'm going to move Math Dad's tower real fast, and let's talk about what glue is. I used the word monomer and polymer earlier, and those are our cool science words of the day. 
And you have to understand these words to be able to understand what glue is and how slime works. So a monomer comes from the word mono, which means one, and then mer, which means unit. A monomer is just one unit. And then if you put a bunch of monomers together, you get a polymer. Poly means many, so that's many units. And glue is made out of PVE, polyvinyl acetate. And that means you take one little unit of polyvinyl acetate, and it actually looks kind of like a little L. And then if you loop them all together, so now here's our, our glue. It's a big, long string of these little L's that are all linked together. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I don't get it. So when we're talking about monomers, like single water molecules, are those monomers? You, not really, because you can't link single water molecules together to make a big long string. Well, that, so, well that, then they can't be polymers, but could they be monomers? Or? A monomer refers to something that could be a polymer. So a single unit that can be linked together, like a building block. Okay. So if you All have right. a necklace, the beads on the necklace are monomers. They are individual units that you can link together to make that very long necklace. If you have a strand of DNA, DNA is a polymer. The individual strands, the nucleotides, are the monomer. If you have starch, like when you eat a potato or spaghetti, that long strand of sugars is starch, and the individual building block is actually glucose. So there are lots of different polymers and monomers that we interact with in, in ordinary life. And if you could, I mean, you technically, you could make a polymer out of anything as long as you can connect them. If you had a single elephant, and then you have a train of elephants where each elephant, the trunk is holding onto the tail of the elephant in front, and it's a big, long elephant train, that is a polymer of elephants. <laughs> <laughs> and on our little on our little worksheet, I have a little, just a little fun little drawing box where you can you can invent your own. But most of our synthetic materials, things like plastic or polyester or our glue, most of those are made out of monomers. And the monomers are some little tiny building block that then can be linked together. Now here is why glue is sticky and why it is liquidy and then when it dries, it's clear. When you have just regular ordinary glue, you have these long strands and then you have a lot of water mixed in between. And when there's a lot of water in between, the strands will slide past each other. But then as the water evaporates and the strands dry, they come together and they stick. And that is why glue can hold things together. That's how white school glue works. But if you add something that will link these together, then it will actually make the glue stick together and hold that water in between. And that's what makes slime. And that's why slime is nice and soft and stretchy because there still is a lot of water in between those glue molecules, but you have borax or a different type of activator linking those long strands together. So when we put our glue into the solution, the water that had some borax in it, that's what happened. These little cross links formed and that's what made the glue so firm and able to hold that water. Now I wanna answer just a couple questions before I show you another type of slime that you can make at home. And then we're gonna talk about non-Newtonian fluids. So I see, um, can you make slime out of corn syrup? That is a good question. Corn syrup, there are a lot of different varieties of slime. And I have to say when I made our slime video, I was surprised at just how enthusiastic some of the responses were and what the variety was of different types of slime that people were familiar with and that they would make. Most recipes that don't involve glue and don't involve boric acid don't make a slime that is quite as stretchy and elastic as the regular slime that you make from glue. And we're gonna make my favorite variety of slime right now. Wait, wait, okay, so what about the glue sticks? Glue sticks would not be a good idea because there's not enough water. And I actually don't know if glue sticks are made out of polyvinyl acetate. I mean, in theory, if you added water and mixed them up and it, they were made out of polyvinyl acetate, maybe you could. But that's something I haven't researched. I don't know if glue sticks are made out of PVA or not. So I'm gonna bring you down here. Whoop. And let's, let's make real quick my favorite type of slime. I, when I did my slime video, I researched and tried out dozens of recipes and then I sort of tweaked 
my own to come up with one that I thought had the best, the best characteristics. But you can adjust it depending on your taste. Some people like slime that is stretchier. Some people like slime that is not as stretchy and not as oozy. And so if you want to make your slime a little more stiff, you just add more contact solution. If you want to make it a little more runny, you can just add a little bit more water. So, and the recipe is on our little handout here. First, I'm adding a half cup of glue. And if we just add our contact solution in our baking soda, then our slime is gonna be pretty stiff. And I want it to be a little bit thicker, a little bit thinner, I mean. And so first, we're gonna add some water. And when people try making slime and it doesn't work, there are a couple, couple main things that usually happen. One is that they don't mix it well enough. Because if you're adding water and you don't mix it, you're gonna have some areas that are thicker and some areas that are thinner, and your slime is not gonna have an even texture. And then the second is that the activator, the thing that you add that makes those cross links form, it really has to have boric acid. And if you have a contact solution that does not have boric acid in here, or if you don't have borax, because you can make your own activator using borax, then it's not going to work. So those are the main issues that people run into when they make slime. And then we'll add some food coloring because it's a lot more fun with some food coloring, although this is totally optional and has nothing to do with the chemistry of turning glue into slime. You can't do white slime. That doesn't work. <laughs> white slime's totally legitimate, but it's not going to be quite as visible or fun as blue slime. I like blue slime. Now I'm going to add a half tablespoon of baking soda. And then we're gonna add a tablespoon of our contact solution as our activator. And this is how we're gonna make Science Mom Slime. There are so many different slime recipes online, you guys. If you wanna go down the slime rabbit hole and find different slime recipes, there are a lot of different ones you can do. But this one's my favorite. And I will tell you, cleanup tip. If slime gets on clothing or other materials where you do not want the slime there, a little bit of warm water and vinegar will take it out. So if you get slime all over, you know, your favorite shirt and you're like, oh no, the shirt is ruined. If you just fill up a bowl with warm water and put some vinegar in there and let it sit, it will come, it will come right out as long as you haven't put it through the washer and dryer yet because the heat from the dryer can cause it to to set and then be really difficult to remove. I'm more worried about our carpet. Be careful. <laughs> our carpet's going to be just fine. Don't worry, Math Dad. <laughs> so I added a half tablespoon of my contact solution there, and you can see it's starting to hold together. But it is not quite all the way. It's not to the point yet where I can pick it up. So I need to add the second half of this tablespoon. So are you following the exact recipe on the page here, on the handout? Yep, I am following the recipe on the handout pretty closely. And now, look at that. Now you can see that most of it is holding together. And if I stir it well, whoop. I think my, I thought I might have added a little extra contact solution, which is totally okay. Now that it is all staying together in one big mass, now it's time to knead it together so that it gets nice and slimy. And at first, it'll seem pretty sticky still. You can see how it's sticking to my fingers, but as you stretch it and get it working together and get that contact solution, the borax, kind of spread evenly throughout, then it will get to that perfect slime consistency point where it is not sticking to your fingers anymore but it is still stretchy and oozy, and it's a non-Newtonian fluid. This is the cool thing about slime and about oobleck. Most fluids like water, they don't change how viscous they are, how thick they are. They don't change that based on how they're moving, but a non-Newtonian fluid does. If you are not applying much force, it's very liquidy, but if you apply a lot of force, then it holds together better and it's more stiff. And this is really cool and kind of bizarre. Not a lot of fluids behave this way. Right. Well, and the force seems to be outwards. Like when you're pulling on it, that, then it, that, there's, that there's force. more resistance. Yeah, yeah. yeah and if you get slime on your fingers, you can actually take another piece of slime and kind of like turn it into a little vacuum and 
it will pick up that slime. So there's another little tip too. So a couple cool things you can do with slime. First, if you take a little piece of it and then drop it, it will actually bounce. And if your slime is more activated with more contact solution, it'll bounce better. This one is pretty oozy slime, so it's not gonna bounce very well. If you put your fingers in it and then pull them out, it makes a very satisfying sound. You can even, you can even kind of make bubbles with it that you can pop. There are some really fun things to do, and you can kind of make almost windows that you can see through by stretching it out. So this is the classic glue slime, which is a lot of fun to play with. Matt, Dad. I just poured some borax on you, this one. Can it, will, yep. this, will this make it more bouncy? It will make it more bouncy. Yep, ooze it together and then drop it. I don't know, it's still pretty wet. Is it possible we use too much water too? Or I don't know. Give it a try. <laughs> bounce fail. Our slime did not bounce. But in my Science of Slime video, you can see some bouncing slime. Now let's talk just a little bit about cornstarch and water or oobleck. So this is a very popular activity to mix cornstarch and water together. And if you get just the right consistency, then you will get something that acts like a solid when you're applying force. Oops. <laughs> And it, it, it was acting so solid that when I went to lift it up, it just shot out of shot out of the bowl. So see, this looks, it looks like, like Play-Doh. It looks like Play-Doh. It's fairly solid, and I can turn it in between my fingers, and it's staying together. But it is not Play-Doh. And you can see that if I hold still and I'm not applying force, it will ooze and drip all the way down to my hand. So this is just cornstarch and water. And the reason why cornstarch is a non-Newtonian fluid is because the particles of starch are small and flat. And sort of like our glue is long strands, the, you know, like a big bowl of wet spaghetti, our polymers, our little, not polymer, our little tiny polymers of starch, they make these little flat shapes that when they slide past each other have some friction. And if they're moving slowly, they can glide over each other pretty well because there's enough water in our mixture to let them do that. But if they're moving fast, they tend to get stuck. And that's what causes this cornstarch mixture to have such a cool effect of being a non-Newtonian fluid. So if I move this spoon very slowly, I can scoop all the way through and it's pretty easy. But if I go fast, I get stuck and it seems hard and then I start to get cracks. And this compound that looks like a liquid will actually crack and break like a solid would. It's a lot of fun to play with, but a good thing to do outside because it is pretty messy. Well, and I, I don't know. I think the cleanup is not too bad as long as you keep it out of the carpet in your shirt. Yeah. But yeah. Um, is there a recipe for that one? Wait. The cornstarch and water one, you just kind of do by fill. So I would say put just a few spoonfuls of cornstarch into a bowl and then add a spoonful of water and stir. And if it's too thick, add more water. If it's too runny, add more cornstarch. You just kind of do it by feel until you get the texture you want. Gotta say that's a pretty nice recipe when it's just two ingredients and one of them's water. Yep. Um, well, I guess food coloring in this case as well. Yeah, we did put some food coloring in too. All right, let's take a few questions and then and then we'll move on to our fact or fiction. Okay, who invented slime? Oh, who invented slime? That is a good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer, but I will tell you that the the slime that you can make out of glue, that has been around since yeah, since before I was born. That's been around as kind of a fun school activity for a long time. Well, I was going to say, I, I didn't have that one. I didn't do that one as a kid. Did I, did I just have a childhood that was it, it missing out on a key component? Here? It's definitely um, it exploded in popularity within the last 10 years, I would say. But I, I remember seeing this when I was a kid. Hmm. So, yeah, up in Idaho farmland, I guess they didn't have it. Just, just, just didn't make it that far. Yeah. Uh, we went to a homeschooling convention one year and we, we were selling some slime and oh my goodness, there were some kids and you could tell they had spent days and days and days and days doing nothing but making slime. Like they didn't, that's how they spent their summer. You could tell because they knew all the recipes. They, <laughs> it, it, was, it was really fun all, to talk all to the them different about pieces it. Too. Yeah. 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 So right. I, I was entertained there. All right. Um, Ooh, I mean, I we, we have an answer. So the first 
oh man, it disappeared in the chat so fast. It went up so quick. But I saw that Science Mom Amber put down a, a little link about, yeah, Mattel first manufactured slime in 1976. So that one was when uh -huh. the first um, commercial varieties of slime went on the market. Uh, and I've got to say that there are a lot of different things like, you know, like Play-Doh, Silly Putty, and other substances that have been marketed over the years with varying properties. And so, so they'll come, they'll go, and yeah, the, it's, it's very possible that some variation of this or something into, that's actually very different chemically but has similar properties might, right. might have been around as Is well. Is it going to drop on the carpet math, Dad? What uh, do you think? I think I'm going to catch it. <laughs> uh, oh, my goodness. Playing with fire. <laughs> So I will say I saw a couple of questions in the chat about the recipe. So just in case you joined us late, there is a free handout that has the recipe for my favorite variety of slime. But if you check out the Science Bombs Guide to Slime, in the description of that video, there are some links to some bonus worksheets and other, other recipes as well. But the, my favorite one you can find on today's handout. And that handout is available where again? On, on Patreon. So there's a link in the description and um, it, both in Facebook and on, on YouTube. There's a link in the description to the Patreon page. All right, two more questions, and then let's let's move on to fact or fiction. All right. Well, actually, the, the yeah the the recipe the, the, the qu recipe. Qu question keeps coming up. That's that's the the big one that has been re relayed to me. Um, so do, are these are these solids or liquids? They are a non-Newtonian fluid. So a non-Newtonian fluid is a liquid. It is something that will flow down a slope. If you like, you know, leave it alone, it will seek the lowest point just like a liquid will, and it will take the shape of its container. But if you apply a lot of force, then it becomes more, it becomes thicker, more viscous. It does not flow as easily. I've got to say, the behavior of these two substances is actually pretty different. Like you, you can't stretch the oobleck, but you can. You can stretch, stretch the slime. Yeah, they have very different properties. My, my daughter yesterday was playing with some slime I made, and she was actually blowing bubbles with it, but I don't really want to demonstrate like putting it on my mouth and blowing bubbles because that's not very sanitary. <laughs> but it's really fun to play with, and it is safe. And this is something that I want to talk about just real quick. There's more about this in my Science of Slime video, but when slime first exploded, it became really popular. There was a big thing about like <gasps> borax, this dangerous chemical that kids are playing with. And when you're talking about safety with chemicals, it's all about the dose. And every, I mean, really everything is a chemical. Water is a chemical. Borax is a chemical. Um, vitamin C is a chemical. And it's something that you need, right? If you don't have vitamin C, you'll get scurvy and get really sick. And you would not, you would not survive without that essential vitamin. Well, borax in small amounts is perfectly safe. It's not harmful at all. But there was such a scare that you see borax-free, you know, recipes popping up all over the place. But most of the borax-free recipes call for contact solution. And if it works and makes slime, it has boric acid in the ingredients, which is essentially the same thing. So, chemistry. Oh, I had a question for you, Science Mom. Yeah. Where does the name Ublek come from? Dr. Seuss. That's true, yes. Yep. The, yeah, this fun story called Bartholomew and the Ublek that we used to read to our kids. It's and, a great one. Yep. All right, factor right. fiction. Factor fiction, I'm ready. See if we can stump math dad. Human beings produce and then swallow a liter of mucus every day. Mucus? Liter of yeah, mucus. like phlegm, you know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, saliva, yes. A whole liter? A whole liter. <sighs> Jaden says true. AJ says true. Say Ember true. says true. <sighs> Holly says false. Deepa says true. No, what, uh, that doesn't make any sense. That's so much. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll go with the chat. True. It is true. Really? So mucus, phlegm, is something that we don't really pay much attention to unless we're sick and, you know, like things get all plugged up and then you've, you're producing more of it and it's not going the direction it's supposed to. It's kind of like coming out everywhere, right? And so we usually think of it as being a bad thing, but mucus is actually incredibly important. If you did not have any mucus inside your nose and your the back of your throat or your lungs, it would hurt so bad to breathe and you would not be able to breathe as, as well. Your lungs have these cilia, these tiny little hairs that help with the exchange of gases. And if they're not wet, they're not gonna work. So you have to have the inside of your lungs being moist and the mucus protects your lungs from drying out and helps it keep that balance of always being moist but not drying out and being able to exchange gases. 
And then in your nasal passage, you know, through your nose, the mucus actually kind of acts like a screen. It helps trap dust and other dirt that you don't want to get in your lungs. And then you do swallow a lot of mucus every single day. And it's sort of your body's way of being like, okay, here are all these particles that we don't want to get into the lungs. We're going to send them down to the stomach instead. And it's it's a pretty cool system, actually. Yeah. All right. All number right. two, <clears throat> a teaspoon-sized bit of proteins produced by the hagfish will expand when they contact water more than 10,000 times. So it'll go from like teaspoon size up to like bucket size and make slime. What? I know that was worded kind of weirdly, but the hagfish, the hagfish can produce slime and it does it by just putting out this little bit of proteins that then... That then expands because you can never have enough slime. Um, what would be the purpose of that? Like predators are attacking a slime. I think that sounds kind of like a cool power. All right. That's, 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 that's sounding better. Uh, to be able to make slime on demand would be a pretty awesome superpower. That's right. You've been slimed. I'm seeing three trues and three falses so far in the chat. Uh, the, the, thanks, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, still, the, I was oddly specific, but... Theodore says true. All right, Theodore. King I'm going, says I'm going false. to Theodore. It is true. Yes. It is true. The hagfish is an amazing animal. And in the answer key, I put links to a couple of really fun articles about hagfish, but they are incredible slime producers and they do it as a self-defense mechanism. So down in the deep ocean, if another animal comes along and gets too close to a hagfish, they will produce this slime and they can actually kind of tie themselves in a knot as they like swim away from it to sort of like block it from getting into them. But then you think about it for animals that breathe water, if there's slime and the water is thick, that's not good at all. So it's a very effective defense mechanism. Man, what, and, and they're way down there where the pressure is incredible. Right? They are. And hagfish, so they're actually eaten as a delicacy. And there was a truck full of hagfish, I believe in Oregon, in Oregon or Washington, that overturned and covered a whole entire highway with slime. Like you have, there's a picture in the <laughs> article I linked where there's like a car that's just covered in this like slime and hagfish. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they can make amazing quantities of slime. All right, fact number three. All right. Parrotfish burp out slimy mucus sacs at night to sleep in. Parrot? Okay, parrotfish. Parrotfish. You know, like little uh, tropical I, know, okay. fish. I was thinking parrots for a second. Like, no, uh <laughs> Okay, parrotfish, they also burp up slime to sleep in. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. well, why not? Sure. True. <laughs> this one is also true. <laughs> so there are a, a fair number of tropical fish that do this. Every single night, they will go and they'll kind of burp out this little sack of slime that completely surrounds them and they sleep in it at night and then in the morning when it's daylight again they swim out of the sack and go about their way and it's to protect them from tiny little isopods I mean they're little tiny little crustaceans kind of like uh. kind of like mosquitoes would be to us these little isopods can actually tack attach onto the fish and suck their blood and so if you have a little slime sack around you at night then that keeps the isopods away what a weird adaptation yeah, pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Fine. Blenophobia is the fear of slime. Fear of slime. Like this this thing has a name. No no way this one's true. This one's true too. They were no. all true today. What? <laughs> and I picked the blenophobia one just for you, Math Dad, because I know that each time you look at slime you're sort of like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have blenophobia. No, not not blenophobia. I think you have like me mesophobia. <laughs> I'm afraid of the mess that the slime might make. <laughs> and I know there's some parents watching that are in the same boat. They're like, oh, I can't stand mm. this stuff. Let me give you a tip for any, for any kids watching. Uh, don't make big messes if you want to do this more than once. Because, <laughs> yeah, the, you, your parents are, are going to have a very finite amount of patience for cleaning up this a, type of thing. It is a good so. tip. If you make slime and you know you want to make this, because look at that awesome mess. It's so cool. If you clean it up afterwards, your parents will be like, sure, you can make slime again. But if you like leave this on the carpet, your slime days are done. So, yep. all right. Mm -hmm. Now we have two birthdays. Whoa. -da -dum -bum -bum -bum. We have. I've got to pull up. Sorry, my fingers got kind of like oh, yeah, not slimy. On, not on the computer. All right. Right here, we have. Happy birthday. This is to Jameson. Jameson. He's hey. eight years old. Happy 8th birthday, Jameson. 
And then it is also Noah's birthday today and Noah is turning nine. And I thought this picture of him holding an owl from um, his, some, one of his science teachers brought in an owl. Isn't that amazing? That is awesome. I have never held an owl. But... So all right, happy all right. birthday to Noah and Jameson. All right, everybody who's watching, I'm going to join in singing the special birthday song that we all know and love. I'm singing a song. I don't know the words. I don't know the words to this song. I'm singing it loud and I'm singing it long, but I don't know the words to this song. No, no I, I don't, don't know, know the words, words to this song. I actually thought it was legit going to be a birthday song. And I was a little, I was a little nervous. I was like, don't sing the one that's copyrighted, that it's ridiculous that it's copyrighted because it's so simple and has hardly any lyrics. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Indeed, happy birthday to Jameson and Noah. That's, a, that's awesome. I told my kids that, oh, it's your birthday, but it came during the shutdown, so you don't, you know, you don't turn ten this year. You have to wait till next year to turn ten. They didn't think that was very funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. So then we decided we'll just do extra birthdays. So we sang twice for them, and they're like, now we're even older. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Math. Our lesson today is on graphing equations. That's right. So last time. Um, in our math lesson, we talked about uh, the coordinate plane. And what we said was that if we put a number line oriented vertically and a number line oriented horizontally, then we, we could just label these numbers, try to space them out equally. One of the big mistakes I see people make is that they, they don't try to space things out well or they use weird scales and because of that, then their intuition cannot help them as they're trying to solve problems. So yeah, always try to do neat work. Uh, at, at any time that you, you're sloppy, you're just going to be confusing yourself or you're going to confuse your teacher. And yeah, everybody loses when, when you're sloppy. All right. So, and we said that we could plot points in the plane. So for example, right here, this point would be the point one comma two. So I can list it as an ordered pair of numbers so the order matters the one came first so we have over one up two and we can plot that point and we're going to make use of that today and we're going to actually plot a graph of an equation and that equation is x plus y equals six so we're going to try this one and when I say we're going to plot an equation, what am I talking about? We're going to find pairs of numbers that make this true. So I, I need a value for x and some value for y that when we add them together will give us 6. So actually, I'm going to ask you guys in the chat, give me some pairs of numbers. What, what pair of numbers would work as a solution to this equation? And there, there's not just one solution. In this case, it turns out there are infinitely many possible solutions, but I want you to chime in in the chat. Name me some pairs of numbers for, for a value for x and a value for y that when you add them together would give us six. And I'm going to look in the chat and, and see what we can come up with. All right. Let's see. There's two, four. I'm going to plot that point right here. I'm not going to label it because I It'll take a, a lot of labeling here, and I, I want to use the space. I saw three, three. That was pretty good. What else did I see? Five, one. Good job, you guys. Four, two. Okay, right there. Um, six, zero. Ooh, this is, this is good. Okay, lots of other duplicates. Excellent. Oh, zero, six. I saw zero, six. And one five. Okay, so we're seeing lots of pairs of numbers there. And yeah, if we started using decimals, we could find more answers. Or if we started using negative numbers, ooh. Look, Math Dad, let's... I made a bubble and it looks like a snail. <laughs> Very nice bubble science. Well, um, I, I did see some people who listed, well, why don't we use one, 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 one? So you use six ones. Well, that doesn't work because I only have two numbers that are adding up to be six. Oh, well, that was kind of kind of a clever approach. Um, yeah, if, if we picked a number like negative one and seven, so if I went negative one, seven, that would be up here off the screen even. You can't even see it. But I want you to notice a trend. 
that some, something neat was occurring here, and that's that all of these pieces, all of these points were on well, what should be a straight line. And I need a straight edge if I actually want to draw it straight. Well, Do you want a different color? Oh, oh, like a ruler or something, except my ruler's not even long enough. But yeah, if in theory, you have to use your imagination a lot in math and pretend things are straight lines because we're not we're not actually as good at drawing straight lines as we wanted. And then draw my circles even bigger so that they cover. But what we have here is a graph of this equation. We found solutions. And it turns out that every single solution to this equation is some point on this line. And not only that, but so we, we, we could find the solutions and then we'll see that they're on this line, but we can work backwards. So I could just pick some point on the line and we could realize, hey, that's actually a solution. So for example, if I look right over here at the far bottom right of the screen, well, we might have the point there, seven comma negative one. <gasps> Is that a solution of this equation? If I do seven plus negative one, does that give me six? Why, well, yes, it does. That is a solution. Or let's go halfway between these two points. So right here, if I put an X, here was the point two, four, here was the point three, three. What's the point that came halfway between those? Well, 2.5, or two and a half, comma, and then 3.5, or three and a half. Let's see that. If I had two and a half plus three and a half, does that actually equal six? And the answer is, yes, it does. Two and a half plus three and a half is six. So what mathematicians do is they uh, study these curves and, and their properties, and they're actually able to glean information about solutions to systems. And often we, we, we care a lot about what those graphs look like. So let, let's do one more together here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, we're going to do the equation 2x minus y equals, and let's just pick one. All right, I've got to move this. 2x minus y equals one. <gasps> so I I need some, oops. Okay, just to keep it easy. Sorry, two x minus y equals zero. All right. What was wrong with one? I, just, I, I worried that we might not come up with solutions. I'm, I'm just trying to keep things things easy. So, but yeah, I, I did see some other people were throwing decimals in the answers there. So I, I like that. All right, two x minus y equals zero. So I need some value for x such that if I multiply it by two and then subtract a y value, I get zero. Science mom, can you think of any answers, any points that are solutions to this equation? Uh. Zero, zero. Oh, she took the easy one, guys. The point zero, zero. So if x is zero, so two times zero minus zero is zero. So she's right on that one. All right. So I'm going to look in the chat and see, can anyone else come up with a solution? One, two. Uh, that, that is correct. Well done, to those of you who found that answer. So yeah, Amy, I see, I see you came up with that. Yeah, so if x is one and y is two, we get two times one, and then minus two is zero. Any others? Two and four. One, two, over two, up four. That is <laughs> correct as well. Okay, also seeing some wrong answers, and that's okay. Yeah, don't worry about being wrong in life. You've gotta try things, especially in mathematics. It's okay to be wrong. What, what won't work is just staring at a problem or just giving up because it's too so, oh it's too hard. Don't do that. Try things, and it's it's okay to be wrong. And, okay, so I saw three six. All right, so that was way up here. All right, and what we're seeing here is we indeed once again have a full line of solutions. 
and we were picking the nice round ones with integer values, but in between, we could find other points. Like halfway between those is the point 1.5 or one and a half comma three. That's another solution of this equation. So if we can find solutions of equations, then we are able to plot them. And once we know what the shape of the solution set looks like, it helps us to decide, oh, is something a possible solution? And there are much harder equations than this that we might try to solve. And in, in fact, I'm going to, ah, I like that, that solution, one comma 0 0.5 was a good solution. We are going to actually open up a graphing calculator. We're gonna to go to Desmos, and we're going to just plug in this exact equation. Tell them there's no, there's no code. Yeah, I, I don't have any code for you today. I'm just opening up a calculator, and I'm just gonna plug some things in. So two X minus Y equals zero. What we see there is a red line, and that red line has all the points that we were just talking about. And I can enter those points in with zero, zero, zero comma zero. There was oh, one comma two. There was two comma four. And yeah, th those points are appearing on that red line. And if I named some point, like, I don't know, negative a million comma seven, well, I know that that's nowhere near this li red line, so I know it can't be a solution to this equation. But for, for straight lines, it, it turns out those don't end up being too difficult. The mathematicians understand those really well, but we could start entering other equations, and when we enter those other equations, so it's things like, I don't know, xy equals x cubed minus y cubed. Um, wow, that one actually looks kind of like a straight line too. So y squared, ah. x raised to the y. I'm just try trying to enter some weird equations. Or we can get really fancy and start using what are called trig equations. So I'm typing in things that you guys won't understand. And th that's totally OK. Don't, you don't need to feel like you understand what I'm doing. I'm just showing that you can plot equations and what you'll get are the solutions and they can be awfully fun. You can even turn them into inequalities and then you can get half of the plane shaded or yeah, we, we can get really fancy and just yeah start entering random stuff and you can sp spend hours and hours just playing seeing, wow, what do these functions mean? So you don't know what this sine and cosine function are. Um, they're kind of showy functions. They, they have their wave functions. But the, the point being, once you are able to plot what the solutions look like to an equation, you have a much better understanding of it. And a lot of the time in an algebra class will be spent on coming up with the graphs of equations. And graphs are useful because we, it helps us to visualize what it is that we are modeling. So that, that was our math lesson for today. Now, that being said, I had left off <laughs> some math from last time. Is, 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 um, we have time to do the math mystery. Definitely answer the Tower of Him. No, 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 no. Okay. Well, I am <laughs> another math mystery behind. So real quick. We, oh, the, the cups one. That's right. We had an eight. Oh. I already lost my marker. There, so there was an eight liter <coughs> container and a five liter container, and we had to come up with exactly four liters. So how are we going to do this? And the answer is there are a couple ways. We're gonna pick one container and we're gonna fill it up and dump it into the other container. So remember the goal is four liters and so let's let's fill up the eight liter container and pour it into the five liter container. So we could start off, so it starts off at zero, zero. Then we fill up the eight liter container. So now we're at eight and zero. We dump the eight liter container into the five liter container. So that fills up the five liter container, <clears throat> leaving three liters in the eight liter container. Then we empty the five liter container. So now we're at zero there. We dump the three from the eight liter container to the five liter container. All right, now we fill up the eight liter container. We're gonna dump yet again. 
So in this case, that will fill up the five liter container, get us down to six liters. All right, then we dump out the five liters, getting us to zero. Now we dump again. So that will fill up the five liter container, leaving us with one liter. And then, huh, running out of room here. So we, have, so we had one five, we dump out the five, that gets us to zero there. We've put the one over, we have zero in the eight liter, one in the five liter, fill up the eight liter container and dump the eight liter container into the five liter container. That would put five in the five liter container and leave four in the eight liter container. Whoa, that's a lot of steps. It, it was a lot of steps. And we, we could have done the, the other strategy <laughs> We could have filled up the five liter container and kept dumping it into the eight liter container. Th that one is actually uh, still just a little bit shorter, but this is another example of the type of problem where you have to dive in and try things. You're not gonna see the end from the beginning on a problem like this, but in instead you think, okay, there's gotta be some way of doing it. And we're not afraid to try things and it's okay to fail. Dude, this was not an easy problem at all. All right, so that was our math mystery. Actually that one traces clear back to last week. But uh, all right, the math mystery I gave us yesterday was the Tower of Hanoi problem. And in the Tower of Hanoi, what we saw were five disks that were stacked on top of each other. And there were three platforms. So platform, platform, platform. And what we wanted to do was to move these disks onto another platform, but there was a restriction. There was a rule that said, you are not allowed to put one of these disks on top of a smaller disk. So you can't ever have this going on. Big disk on top of a smaller disk. So that, that that's a no-no. And the challenge was to see if we could move them over. So we're, we're gonna try this. So I'm gonna move the small one to one platform, put the bigger one here, oh, move the smaller one, put the middle-sized one, and now I'm gonna move the small one back oh. to here. Ooh, move the second one, and then put the small one there, all right? Up next, I'm moving level four guy, put the small one here, so this one here. Hopscotch type. Right. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're we're bouncing all around, hoping that we're making progress. And you know what? Sometimes you don't know. Maybe you're working backwards. Maybe maybe, maybe you're not moving forward, and that's okay. Uh huh. And now, the big guy here, small one here, the medium sized one here, small one there. Sorry. Right there. And yeah, just slowly moving pieces around and hope hoping that I'm making some, some good progress. <laughs> and will you look at that? Ta-da! Took me 31 moves to get there. Were you and, counting in your head the whole time? Uh, not really. I, so, okay, here's the surprise. Uh, this has a lot to do with counting in binary. So we've learned how to do this before. Ooh. Remember how we learned how to count to binary on one hand? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And we, we were able to count all the way up to 31. Well, in that count there, we could pay attention to, so at, at each time I put up new fingers, which was the biggest finger that, that moved, biggest meaning so, so in this direction, so the ones, the twos, the fours, the eights, the 16s position. And that corresponded with the exact block that I moved here. So what I was doing was I was always moving this little one every other time. So it corresponded to my, my thumb. But I always moved it one spot to the right, except when it got to here, one spot to the right, looped it around. And then I just saw, okay, then, then I'm going to move whatever was below it and was available. And yeah, so, so basically I'm just moving the piece here that corresponded to the largest of the fingers that changed, and that actually carried out the entire algorithm to solve this. So that's actually the smallest number that you can use. 
so th 31 moves. So if, if you had six discs, it would take you 63 moves. And That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. so this is a, a very, very famous problem. And then I do have a new math challenge for tomorrow. That math challenge involves... Is, and it's on the handout. If you, yeah, if you just link in the description, you can get it. Yep. So we had a square inside that. We had another square that joined the midpoints. Inside that one, we had yet another square joining midpoints. And then we had a line across this diagonal. And my challenge for you here is not to draw this the way that I just drew it, but instead, what you have to do is try to trace this guy out. So you, you pick a starting point, and then you're gonna try to trace the whole thing from start to finish, but you're not allowed to trace the same line twice. Uh-oh. So if you get there, then you're stuck. Yeah, I got, I got stuck. So, okay, so that one didn't work. I, I tried to trace the whole thing, but I, I left off two line segments. So my challenge for you guys is, can you trace this entire figure without lifting your pencil? And without going over a line twice. Yep. Cool. All right, Math Dad, I have a what's in the bag for you, a riddle. All right, I'm and ready. <clears throat> I have leaves, but I am not a tree. I have leaves, but I'm not a tree. What, ha what else has leaves? Uh, oh, but I it's, have it's a, a spine, it's spine a... and hinges, but I'm not an animal no, or it, a door. It's, it's a book. It's a book. It is. I've told you all. I cannot tell you more. It's a book. Good job, Math Dad. And then before we do our engineering challenge, well, I guess I should show you our, our I'll show you the engineering challenge and the art prompt. And then I want to show you how to clean slime. So our engineering challenge is to build a popsicle stick bridge and see how much weight it can hold. And our drawing prompt is to create a new planet. And I wanna give a special thank you to Madison, who um, her outline for a design your own quarantine episode was the inspiration for this episode today, and that's her drawing prompt. And a special thank you to Molly, who yesterday's lesson was, um, was patterned after her submission. All right, let's say you have slime that gets on to fabric and it is stuck there. So the brand new washcloth that we just barely arrived the other day. Yeah, don't worry about that. Okay. It'll come out. You're just checking, you know. If it is still wet, you can actually do a pretty good job if you get some of it. Sometimes you can kind of vacuum it off, but once it starts to dry, it becomes harder and you're not going to be able to pull it all off. So that's, how do you get it off? Yeah, that's not coming off at all. You you can get it off by simply taking this rag and putting it into a container of water and vinegar. And then you need to let it sit for about 10 minutes. So we're going to now show you our engineering challenge. And then I will show Math Dad how we got the rag clean. Oh, I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> All right. Let me turn the view here and show you the popsicle bridges that we made. So we have one that is fairly simple here where we just glued in a triangle pattern. And now, for the fun part, we're gonna see how much weight they can hold. We're gonna take this five pound weight and we're gonna twisty tie it to the, the popsicle bridge. Yeah, I'm just gonna set it on top. Um, we could, I thought it would be more fun to hang it. Well, this thing, this won't distribute the weight. That'll put it all on one stick. Exactly. That... Okay, whatever, whatever. So we're going to pick a stick and twist it around so that it is attached. Putting it on top would, would totally work too. And if it survives five pounds, we'll do it your way for the next weight. All right, all right. So here we go. So tell us in the chat if you think it's gonna hold or not. I'm oh! <laughs> oh. <laughs> no. Almost, almost. A, a valiant effort. All right, now we have a bigger bridge. All right. That is reinforced. This one's gonna work. This uh, worked hard on this one. And then are we putting the weight on the top? Yep, yep, we're just gonna set that weight on top. All right, let me untwist it and get it nice and, okay. Here we go, five pounds. Oh, Ooh. piece of cake. <coughs> Not even right. a challenge. Should we go higher? Yes. 10 pounds, here, you do the honors. All right, 10 pound weight. Set it down carefully. Oops, it's tipping over. Okay, laying it down. Oh, it held it. All right, do we have another weight? Um, 
I think we do. I, I thought I brought another there. one. Yes, yes. Okay. How big is this one? This one's a 20 pound 20 weight. pound weight? Oh my goodness. Hey, you can't block their view while you put it uh, on. Uh, uh, sorry. Mm. One jar. <gasps> 20 pounds. It's working. Uh. All right. I'm going to add. Wait, wait. Leave it right there. I'm going to add the 10 pound weight. And I'm also moving to the side so if they fall, they don't squash my toes. Oh my goodness. All right, should we add the fresh one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we'll clean that up later. <laughs> so, um, first off, apologies for that very loud sound because I'm sure that our microphone picked that up and translated it very loudly. And then second off, um, maybe don't do this so high up if you're trying weights at home because if I hadn't moved out of the way, I could have had my toes broken. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, on the ground would have been been better. Yes. yes. Less visually we'll, appealing. But... We'll, we'll call that a safety fail for science, <laughs> common math. Dad. If that had happened to one of our recorded videos, we totally would have edited that out. Like that never happened. <laughs> All right. Our <clears throat> our chat unfortunately appears to have frozen in Streamyard. It won't refresh, and I'm not seeing new comments, which is kind of a bummer. So, science mom, um, our, our science moms who are watching in the chat, if you'll text us questions, if there are any questions we should answer. But I think we should share our art slideshow. Yes, yes. Because we had some fantastic art submissions come in yesterday. All right. I'm trying to remember what the prompt was. I, I to draw forget. your favorite animal with one new trait. Oh, man. Look at that. Super long tongue and so that it can get yeah. treats yeah isn't that great i think it'd be a cool adaptation i'd go for that good job <laughs> yeah yeah and then savannah age three with a fantastic kitty here a second set of whiskers that act like antennae uh -huh. and oh, act like a second set of ears isn't that awesome so like super sense yeah. kitty yeah and savannah nice cat a butterfly dog. Great job, Addison. Addison, yeah. Super cute. Dogs would like to fly. Oh, dogs would love to be able to fly. Yeah. A <laughs> Therizinosaurus that has the ability to take down a Gigantosaurus. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> like so, it. yay, dinosaurs. Love it. A Chihuahua with human ears so it can hear both dogs and humans. Dogs here with very different frequency than we do. And I have to say, that would be really cool to have like overlapping. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the dog whistle wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to hear that anymore if it had human ears, right? It would have both. Oh, okay. It's got, it got both. Winged rainbow turtle. I love I the wings shopping. and I love the colors. Boy, I know a tortoise that would love wings. <laughs> we have a tortoise. Our tortoise would be very happy to be able to fly, I think. An ostrich that can fly. Uh, That's a fantastic. I think they probably feel cheated. They're like, hey, dude, I'm a bird. Why can't I fly? So, <laughs> finally. <laughs> yeah, great job, Ava. And then a super wise owl. And I love the little library. Nice job, Ivan. Yes, yes. Edward drew a eagle with a robot head. Ooh, Whoa. super smart eagle. Laser targeting. Fire or ice. Fabulous Ooh, work. Nice. A turtle with wings. Oh, yeah. No. From Austin. Nice job. The ne their next step in evolution. That's right. <laughs> and a shout out for the song. Okay, Austin, Connor. A shark seal and a, a fin <laughs> so that it can be faster than sharks. Well, I love it. And all the other seals would be scared of it, like, ah, Yeah, that's away. right. <laughs> a cat designed to live in the midnight zone, like down in the deep ocean. I love Ooh, it. Very nice, Carissa. Lure in its prey. A flying pig. Oh. So then that, that expression, like when pigs fly, you'd be like, oh, there's a flying pig right there. That's right. The impossible is possible. And a sharp, poisonous spikes everywhere on a bunny rabbit. Whoa. <laughs> awesome. A cuddly little bunny that. Ah, no, run away. No longer cuddly. It's become a fearsome animal. Run I like away. it. Pink so that she blends in with cupcakes. I love it. Great work. Ooh. Healing tears. Ooh, that would be awesome. Yeah, Lily. See, what is this? Very is nice. A... I think it's a, it's a unicorn with wings and healing tears. Nice. And then a spitting a... seahorse that spits out jets of water to move around. Closest relative, the octopus. So they took, because octopi really do, like, they look oh, that they way by... Oh, yeah. they Yeah. And so to, they'd be able to move even faster, because seahorses are pretty slow. I like that. Cat, flying cats. Porter, this is such a great idea. I have to say... If flights can, 
if cats can fly, yeah, yeah, yeah. they would. They did. They... <laughs> <laughs> cats are so such funny animals and so sneaky. If they could they, fly, they're devious. We'd be in yeah, trouble. Yeah. So, yeah. King Kitty. Yeah. <laughs> the singing unit. Oh, great work, Tasha. Singing animals would be be really interesting. That would be fun. All right. A unicorn dog. I love it. So much power. <laughs> oh, and this one's cut out. Oh, I love the collage. It's a beautiful bird. Fish. And right. then we had some awesome air forts done as well. Ooh, very nice page. <laughs> I'm singing. I know the words. How else would I sing this song? It's a very, very good question. <laughs> very annoying. What? what? <laughs> and then our, our um, painting with the scientists yesterday, we did a marsh. And I loved seeing the beautiful artwork that came in. So thank you to everyone who joined us there. Now, I did get a text from Science Mom Krista saying that everyone would like to see the bridge collapsing in slow motion. And that brings up an interesting question. Where did the bridge even go? Did it break? Uh, or did the did the weights just slide off? So yeah, some of it came apart. So what? All right. So I think this is a great suggestion. We will fix our little part of our bridge that broke. And then I think we should hang the weights because if we hang the weights, then like the strain, I think will be a little slower. We won't have the possibility of it like going off balance and then them just falling off. And a slow motion video of that, I think would be fantastic. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I there's mean, our homework. We could, we could try to watch the, or re, the replay and, and try to slow that down, but it wouldn't be captured at high speed, so. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that sounds like a fabulous suggestion. <laughs> So we will, we will do that for tomorrow. And tomorrow we are learning all about how cell phones work. So if you've ever wondered, how is it that you can make a phone call and talk to someone instantly far away? How is that signal transferred? How does that happen? And also, did you know that there are rare el earth elements in phones? What are they? What do they do? That's what we'll be finding out tomorrow. Well, that's pretty cool. Do we have a scientist coming on Friday? We do. We have one of our viewers coming on because she's a veterinarian. And so we are going to interview a veterinarian on Friday and learn more about people who are doctors for animals. Because that's really, and if you think about it, I mean, medical doctors, we really appreciate and respect because they know, they know a lot, they've studied a long time and they can take care of us when they're sick. But to be a veterinarian, you have to be a veterinarian for multiple types of animals. And that's pretty amazing. Sounds tricky to me. Thanks for joining us, you guys, and a big thank you to our, our moderators and everyone in the chat. We so appreciate you taking the time to learn some math and science with us. And thanks and thanks we'll also to those of you who have been sharing your artwork and yeah, your, your fun and your enthusiasm for this learning. Yep, and we'll see you tomorrow.